Now, brothers and sisters, we want to turn our attention to the Word of our God. So let's open together to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2. We're going to be focusing this morning on verses 42 through 47. So Acts 2, 42 through 47. Here we read, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number, day by day, those who were being saved. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of our God. Now I want to pray and ask that he would help me to open it for us and pray for all of us that he would help us hear and receive the word that he has for us today. So will you pray with me? Father, we come before your throne this morning, but we understand also as we come to the preaching of the word that, that you are inviting us to your table where you feed us as your children. Father, it is you who has said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of your mouth. Father, I pray through the preaching of the word today that, Lord, that words would proceed from your mouth and they would accomplish the purpose for which you send them today. Father, I pray that you would wield the sword of the Spirit over your people today. Pierce our hearts if need be. Lord, I pray that today here in this place that you would be glorified and that your church would be edified. In the name of Jesus we say and we pray, amen. Amen. As a church, we finished out last year by looking at the devotion of our uh, shepherd savior to us. Well, I'd like to start the new year as a, as a church family by, by looking at the devotion that we have to our savior. And I, as I said before, I really, what I really wanna do this morning is, is to chart the course, to point us in the direction that we need to, to begin heading this new year. In Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47, we see what it looks like when Christ is in the midst of his church. We see what it looks like when the Holy Spirit is moving with power among his people. Uh, we see what it looks like when a body of people are not, not religiously devoted, but passionately devoted devoted to Christ and to his mission. So this is what I want to do to, today. I want to look at three things. Number one, what it looks like to be devoted to Christ. Number two, what sometimes stands in the way of our devotion. And number three, what it takes to have the kind of devotion that we see here in this portion of Scripture. So are you all ready to start? Number one what devotion to Christ looks like. What I want to see, what I want us to see together as we dive into this, first and foremost, that devotion to Christ equals devotion to his church. Let me say that again. Devotion to Christ means devotion to to his church. In fact, you cannot say that you are loyal to Jesus if you are not loyal to his people. You can't do that 
why do I say that? Is that biblical? I hope you're asking that question. Is that biblical? The first thing that we all need to understand is that Jesus is one with his church. Ephesians chapter 1, 22 and 23 says, He, God the Father, put all things under his, Christ the Son's feet, and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. You see, you can't talk about Jesus without talking about the church. Jesus is not a disembodied head. We talk about the headless horseman. But we don't have a bodiless Savior. Not only is Jesus one with this church, but he himself is radically devoted to it. Now, we can't say we're devoted to Jesus if we're not devoted to the things he's devoted to. If you want to understand how devoted Jesus is to the church, listen to Ephesians 5.25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Jesus is not, he's not just one with this church and he's not merely radically devoted to it. I want you to think about this. The existence of the church is intertwined with the under, with God's underlying purpose for all creation. The church is intertwined with God's underlying purpose for all creation. Ephesians 3, 9, and 11, God, through 11, God, God who created all things, okay, all right, God who created all things, so far so good, all right, what's it say next? So that, you want to know why God created things? So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord. The purpose for all creation, the purpose for every sunrise, the purpose for the next breath you breathe is that God would display his wisdom, his love, his glory, his honor and power through his son in the redemption of his church and being united to her forever. All right, pastor, you're getting a little wound up and excited, and I am. You ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> but I want to pause here for a moment. Jesus is not devoted to the church as an abstract concept. He gave his life for his people. The church consists of men and women, boys and girls, whom Christ has redeemed with his own blood and has adopted into his family. So, at a very practical level, the local church, like the first one we're reading about in Acts chapter 2, and like our church family here at the road, the local church is the embodiment. It is the representation of the bride of Christ. That's what, we represent, so what local churches represent, his bride. Our devotion to Jesus is not devotion to a brick and mortar location, right? It's not a church building, nor is it devotion to a nebulous concept. Our devotion to the Son of God gets lived out. It gets fleshed out within the, the context of a local assembly of believers, Right? You're not telling me anything if you're just saying, you say, I'm devoted to the church, and you're devoted to some imaginary thing out there in space. No, if we are devoted to the church, 
It's going to get worked out in the context of a local body of believers. And that's exactly what we're seeing here in Acts 2. Now, so what does this devotion look like? Um, there are four things here that their devotion was centered around. So let's look at these briefly. Number one, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. This is really the foundational principle. What did the, the apostles' teaching consist of? Right? It consisted, it was, it was, the, they, it was the word of God. Christ gave the apostles' his word, and then Jesus gave the apostles the Holy Spirit so that they could accurately convey the word of God to us. Friends, the call on the true church in the 21st century is the same as the call on the church in the first century, that we would be devoted to the word of God, the word of Christ, as it has been handed down to us in the pages of the scriptures. Everything else flows out from there. The church will never move beyond this. And if we could just see, there's a lot of things I want you to see this morning, but if, if you could just see this, the power and the beauty of the church, the true power and the true beauty of the church lies within the degree to which we hold fast to the teaching of the apostles. Second thing that they were devoted to was called the fellowship. Now, we've got to be careful with this one because, you know, we're Baptists and we have fellowships. And we often use that word to refer to the things we do together when we're not uh, gathering for public worship or Bible study or prayer, right? Fellowships are like social things we do together. And those are good. <laughs> Y'all know, know me. I'm all for all of that, right? Don't, don't want to do away with that. But that's, that's not the main point of what he's talking about here with fellowship. Um, uh, this, this concept of fellowship refers to the communion that we have together with each other as saints because of the union that each one of us has with Christ, right? As brothers and sisters in Jesus, our souls are knit together with one another's because we are in him. So, so fellowship refers to this fact that we are devoted to one another. And as you see here in the passage, we are devoted, we, we need to be, we should be devoted to each other holistically, right? We need to be committed to one another's um, spiritual, physical, emotional, material, and even one another's financial well-being. Third thing they were devoted to was the breaking of bread. This one probably lines up a little bit more with what we're thinking about when we think of fellowship. Um, here, what you see is that, that believers were spending large amounts of quality time with each other, both in public worship and in each other's homes. This was significant time throughout the week. You look back at verse 46, day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes. They received their food with glad and generous hearts. You see what was happening here? The gospel came to the early church in such a powerful way that it made them generous. They were being generous with other believers in particular, with their time, with their homes, with their food, and with their possessions. Fourth thing they were devoted to were the prayers. Prayer was such a powerful aspect of the life of the early church. Here when the Holy Spirit was moving with, with power, it would be a very helpful thing to do. As a matter of fact, I mean, when I thought about this, I thought maybe we should do this, and you know what, maybe we will. Um, it would be a very profitable study to study the prayers in the book of Acts. They had 
they, we're told in chapter one, they gave themselves to prayer. They, they sought God, God's guidance through prayer. Prayer wasn't just a means of getting things from God. It was a means of worshiping God and, and seeking his face and his presence. There's this great place in Acts chapter four when, when the voice of the people were, they joined, they joined their voices in prayer. And at the end of this prayer, we're told that the place where they gathered was shaken. You ever sometimes want to see God shake things up in church? Probably so. Probably sometimes God needs to shake things up in church. You want to see God move with power today in the church? Where are the prayers? Where is the desire to pray? Where is the hunger for God? Where's the longing for something more than just, you know, I was thinking a little bit, it's so, you know what, the, you know what the danger of being lukewarm, you know, remember Revelation 3, being lukewarm? You know what the danger of being a lukewarm church is? Lukewarm feels so comfortable. You don't even, you can't even tell, right? There was an old Puritan who once said that Jesus went more readily to the cross than you and I do to the throne of grace in prayer. That ought to be convicting. Now, if you ask me, Pastor Matt, what's your vision for the road? What's your vision for 2022? Brothers and sisters, um, I, 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 let me share this with you. I have no other vision than that you and I together would joyfully be devoted to these four things that the early church was devoted to. Do you know what the church doesn't need? The church does not need more programs. Oftentimes, these, these powerful elements that were at, at, in play in the early church get replaced with, with, with programs or gimmicks which sometimes give the appearance of life within a church, but what they really do is they rob the church of her true power. You cannot reduce life in a congregation. You cannot reduce worship or discipleship or evangelism to a program. Gimmicks and programs cannot replace the power of the Word of God when it is functioning like a like sword of the Spirit. It's, it's, it's a powerful weapon, a powerful tool in the hands of God as he exercises it in the life of his people. That's a peek at what devotion to Christ looks like in the context of a local church. I'd like to talk now for a few minutes that why sometimes, well, you know, what sometimes stands in the way of devotion like this, right? What we're seeing here in the early church on a large scale was passionate devotion to Christ. This wasn't, this wasn't a, this was not a duty, willpower kind of devotion, right? This was something else altogether different. The gospel had so transformed the, the hearts and the minds of the early church that, that it fundamentally changed the way that they lived. Now, you, you can always, you, this kind of devotion is easy to spot. It's easy to identify by the willingness of a person to sacrifice for it. You see, if there's something you and I are really committed to, we will, we will move heaven and earth to get to it, right? We will sacrifice all kind of other, you know what? When, when something is of ultimate value to us, we will sacrifice lots of good things because we understand the ultimate value of it. So you can always spot someone who's really devoted to something, a cause, by their willingness to sacrifice for it. In the Old Testament, God gave Moses instructions to build a tabernacle 
Well, that's not a word that you and I use nowadays. But the tabernacle was a tent. And, and, and as a matter of fact, it was a very elaborate tent that God gave Moses instructions to build. And, and it was a tent that served as a makeshift temple for the people of God while they journeyed, while they traveled through the wilderness until they reached the promised land. And the, the, the tabernacle was the place where the presence of God dwelt among the people of God. And during that time of the tabernacle, that there would be a visible, the visible presence of the glory of God. Sometimes you may have heard it called the Shekinah glory of God in the form of a pillar of cloud by day and a, and a pillar of fire by night. And, and God, God gave Moses instructions for the families that each family should camp around the tabernacle. And, and he, he told each one of them that the openings of their tents, they would actually, the front door of their tent would face the tabernacle. And do you see what the effect of that was? What was God communicating to his people? Right? All of life. Every morning when you come outside of your home, every day when you come back in, the first thing, the last thing, you, your whole life is lived in orientation to the place where God's presence is. Now, in the New Testament, the tabernacle or temple is done away with and it's replaced by something else. What is that? The church. The church is the, not a building, a people. is the place where the presence of God, where the glory of God dwells. And our lives as new covenant believers are meant to be oriented around the church, the place where God has ordained for his glory to be. So what are some things that might stand in the way of, of being truly devoted like the kind of devotion we're seeing here, here in Acts 2? Well, in order to be devoted like this, the first thing, you, you, you must be born again. Every single one of us were born into this world dead in our sins and trespasses, alienated from God. And in our, uh, Ephesians chapter 2 says that we were by nature the children of wrath meaning that we deserve God's judgment. And before God's, before God's grace comes into our life, we're in this desperate position of, of needing this heart transplant, this new life that only the Holy Spirit can provide. And what you see in the behavior of the believers in Acts chapter 2 is the fruit of the regeneration of the Holy Spirit. Until the, until the Holy Spirit comes and gives you a new heart, you can go through outward motions of devotion, but it will never be an inward desire, an inward compulsion. It's only honestly going to function like a burden to you, right? Serving Jesus, getting up, coming to church on Sunday mornings. If there's not that inward work of the Holy Spirit in you that makes you want it, <laughs> makes you hungry for it, You're dead in your sins. And your attempts are only going to be a burden. You must be born again. Now, something else that sometimes stands in our way. I know, um, here, I mean, this, this is me. And this is pretty much all of us. Right, if you're not, if you're, if you're, if you are born again, you're definitely in the second category. If you're not born again yet, you know you need the new birth. I pray that God would grant that to you today. But you might be here today. You might be born again, 
And what you're doing right now is you're trying to hold hands with Jesus on this side and at the same time you're trying to hold hands with your sin. We're never going to be able to serve Christ with passionate devotion as long as we're trying to hold on to him and our sin. You know what that would be like? You know, I know some of you made this resolution. You're going to start eating healthy and lose weight. You're going to lose weight. So what you're going to, you're going to eat healthy all day long. And right before bed, you're going to eat a whole box of Krispy Kreme donuts every night. That's not going to work. That'll work easier than it will to hold hands with Jesus in your sin. Something's got to give. Now, I have a hard word for you, okay? But if, to the degree this is you here today, you need to hear this. There are times when I need to hear this, okay? This is James, the brother of Jesus, speaking to professing Christians. And he's speaking right now to Christians who are choosing to try to hold hands with Jesus and trying to hold hands with sin. Listen to what he says, James 4.4. 4. You adulterous people. He's saying you're cheating on Jesus. You're being unfaithful. Do you not know that the French, that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. If you have the Holy Spirit living inside you, if there is a longing to be passionately devoted to him, but you're also holding on to sin, you know you are. Sinful behaviors, sinful habits, sinful ways of thinking. Brothers and sisters, let today be the day where you lay those sins down at the foot of the cross and repent and leave them there. Maybe you're here today and... You are born again, and you are not walking in any open, willful sin. This is a category that, that I, I, I think I see for 21st century American Christians is, is specifically or um, especially problematic. Right? You're born again, and you're not, you're not willfully choosing sin, but you are so distracted with so many different things in your life. Your devotion is so divided among so many things, even good things. I'm not saying they're all bad things. But your devotion is so divided that it's not possible for you to be devoted to Christ and his church. Will you imagine something with me for a moment? I want you uh, to imagine that you are going to hire a consultant. You're going to hire a consultant and you're going to pay him to, to um, investigate and examine your life. He's going to analyze all the different parts of your life and at the end, he's going to give you a report that tells you what you are actually devoted to. All right, so imagine with me first thing he's going to look at is how you spend your time. Well, all of us, you know, six to eight hours of sleep a night. We all have to work during the day, right? Okay, I'll give you those. Just for the sake of argument, I'll give you those. Even though, you know, there's some theological implications big time for our sleep and our work. However, let's just think for just a moment, because we don't have all day about your discretionary time. How many times over the last week did you open your smartphone? How many minutes or hours did you spend on social media? Uh, uh, you know, I was getting ready to let y'all have it today and there was a little sparkle of integrity in me and I said, well, Matt, I, you know, because I know I struggle with this. I said, let me get the smartphone out and do some investigating. Last week, 
more than five hours on Facebook for me. Over three hours on YouTube. Some of y'all like that much. Some of y'all like, that's all. (laughs) How are we spending our discretionary time? How much, what percentage of our time are we giving to pursuing the presence? What percentage of our time are 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 we spending seeking the face of God among his people? Next, they look at your finances. This is an easy target. You've heard it in church many times, but I think it's a good application. You know, if someone was only looking at your, your bank account, your expense report, you know, what would they say you ultimately valued based on the way you use your money? Next, the consulting firm is going to download your Google search history over the past year. If someone, all they had, the only window they had to look into your life was your Google search history, what would they say you valued most? What are you devoted to? Finally, they audit the plans for your future, your hopes and your dreams. What will they find? Are your goals and your greatest aspirations centered around Christ and his family? Or are they centered around something else? If we can go back, if we can go back to the, the picture of the tabernacle and the families camping around it for just a second, all the family's homes surrounding the tabernacle with the front doors facing it, would that be a good description of your life and the life of your family? Or would a better description be that it was your little tent was the center of everything and Christ and his church was one of the little tents out there surrounding yours? Let's look at number three, what it takes to have this kind of devotion. There's, there, there are two ways we could approach this, right? All right? As far as I see it, I see two ways we can move forward with what we've looked at so far. You know, and first of all, I hope that every, every single one of us ought to be saying two things right now. Um, I hope you're saying, oh man, I do, I do want to be passionately devoted to Jesus. I do want to experience life in the family of God like we read about in Acts chapter two. But there's gotta be another part that's saying, man, I fall so far short. My, uh, when, I really, when I really analyze the, my devotion, I, I, it is not what it should be, and I want it to be, be strong. What can I do? What can we do? That's what they asked Peter. Peter, what can we do? Their hearts were pricked. What, can we, what do we do now? Well, one approach would be bad Christian. Bad Christian. You should be ashamed of yourself. You, you know how devoted Jesus was to you. You should be more devoted than you are. And you know something, guilt in a twisted way, y'all, guilt feels good. And it does motivate to an extent. But just, just listen. By, by, the, by the mere power of your will, it's not going to take you very far. Can I prove it? Uh, guess what? January, the gyms will be full. February, much less. March, crickets, right? That, that's what happens on the basis of your mere willpower, right? What got into these early Christians? You know, you know, the answer is really very simple. They didn't create a program. They didn't come up with a strategy. The apostles didn't stand up every week and give people guilt trips until they got in line with the program. What led to this was the powerful preaching of the gospel. It was Peter's sermon that had been anointed with the power of the Holy Spirit, and it was the Holy Spirit who had pricked the hearts of these early saints. It was the moving of the Holy Spirit coupled with the preaching of Christ and him crucified that transformed the lives of the people. That's what did it. And I I can imagine that we as a church might struggle with faith to believe that that's what could do it here. 
there was a man in Scripture. This man had it all. The right family, the right education, plenty of money, power, social standing among the elites of his community, a degree of fame. Saul of Tarsus was a man who had it all. But one day, he met Jesus, and it changed his life forever. On the road to Damascus, Jesus came and basically stomped down Paul's little tent and established his glory as the center of Paul's life. And the church and the people of God as the body of Christ was Paul's mission every day thereafter. Listen to what he said in Philippians 3, verses 7 through 9. He said, but whatever gain I had, he had just gone through a list of all of his accomplishments, his pedigree, you know, all the wonderful worldly things that he would have boasted in before he met Christ. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the sur surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Brothers and sisters, could it be that today, here at the road, that God could use a weak man preaching a powerful gospel to set our hearts on fire for him and his kingdom. My plan and vision for 2022 is that together you and I with joy would be devoted to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, to the prayers. My prayer is that God would open every single one of our eyes like he did Paul's to see the surpassing worth of Christ. You talk to those people, you go back and talk to those people who are selling their possessions opening their homes, giving away their time, investing in other people. You know what they would tell you? They had discovered the surpassing worth of Christ and they never made a sacrifice. And I know here, you know, I don't want to come off today because brothers and sisters, we've been, it's, we're almost six years now. Many of us have been week in, week out, a part of each other's lives. I don't mean to come off like, you know, we're just a dead church and we, we need God to come in here and completely raise the dead. That, that's, y'all understand that? I, I don't mean it that way, but I go back to that song that I grew up singing, um, Showers of Blessing. So far, I'm thankful. I don't want to begrudge the day of small things, but so far, I, I, I just think what, what God's done among us, we, we could sing... Mercy drops around us are fallen, but for the showers we plead. This is what I want to pursue with you in 2022 and really the rest of our time, however long God gives us as a church family. Let's pray. Father, I give you, I give you thanks for your goodness in giving us your word. And, and giving us really, uh, in, in living history, examples of, of when we have seen you moving mightily among your people, Father. And Father, Lord, we, on the one hand, we, we confess, Lord, 
We, we are devoted, but we also confess the weakness of our devotion. We confess the dividedness of our devotion. Father, we're so distracted by many things and many times where we, we do fall back and give in to, to sin, but Father, we pray, Lord, that you would do a mighty work here. Father, I pray that you would stir up the hearts of your people but to, with a great passion and hunger for your glory, for your presence, for your power. Lord, not, not so we could be anything, I pray, Father, more and more that we would decrease, that your son Jesus would increase. Lord, hear us now as we respond to you in worship. In the name of Jesus.